Good morning, everyone, and uh, it's a great pleasure and a privilege to be able to share something with you this morning. <clears throat> As many of you will know, I'm a great admirer of the Dutch Reformed philosopher and theologian Cornelius Van Til. For the last 10 years, I've run a website, www.vantil.info, which is devoted to all things Van Tilian. Some of you may have seen my coffee mug with the slogan, Cornelius Van Til is my homeboy. <laughs> it's also a little known fact, at least until today, that my daughters have a cuddly stuffed dog at home who answers to the name Van Til. Uh, I'm not sure how fitting a tribute that is, but there it is. So why? Why this admiration for Van Til, or what some might even consider obsession? I'm persuaded that Van Til was one of the most important and innovative Christian thinkers of the 20th century. Whereas his reformed predecessors called for a reformation in Christian theology and worship, Van Til called for a reformation in Christian apologetics. He's best known for his advocacy of a presuppositional method in apologetics. He argued that when we do Christian apologetics, we mustn't simply appeal to facts and evidences as though they speak for themselves and can settle the debate between the Christian and the non-Christian, because how a person interprets facts and evidences will depend on that person's presuppositions, that's to say their foundational guiding assumptions and convictions about God, about the universe, about the human mind, about truth, about values, about reason, about possibility, and so on. In short, how one interprets facts and evidences will depend on one's worldview. And there's no such thing as a neutral worldview, a worldview that is indifferent toward God, toward Jesus Christ, toward the Bible. It will either be a worldview centered on the true God, revealed in Scripture, or it won't be. So the Christian apologist, Van Til argued, sooner or later has to engage the unbeliever at the level of his presuppositions, at the level of his worldview. Rather than ignoring those presuppositions, the Christian must expose them and directly challenge them on the basis of his own Christian presuppositions. Now, many of Van Til's critics have objected that this view of matters leads inevitably to fideism, uh, or to a, a kind of Mexican standoff. The Christian has his presuppositions, the non-Christian has his presuppositions, each one reasons in terms of his own presuppositions, and so it's impossible to move forward in the debate, or to, to rationally adjudicate between these two conflicting positions. But Van Til did not agree at all that that was the case. He contended that there is a way to rationally vindicate the Christian's presuppositions over against the non-Christian's presuppositions, and that way is to use a transcendental argument. Now, what is a transcendental argument? A transcendental argument is a distinctive kind of argument that aims to identify the presuppositions of rational thought as such, rational thought in itself. In order for us to have any rational thoughts at all, in order for us to be able to engage in reasoned discussions at all, certain things must be true about ourselves, about what kind of beings we are, and about the universe that we inhabit. Human rational thought has its own presuppositions, its own preconditions. And Van Til's provocative claim was that these presuppositions can only be accounted for by a Christian biblical worldview, a worldview centered on an absolute personal God and his self-revelation. Van Til observed that the Christian and the non-Christian both assume that rational thought is possible. They have to, otherwise they wouldn't bother to engage in discussion and debate in the first place. The possibility of rational thought is a given. It's taken for granted. 
But then we should ask this question. Whose presuppositions, whose worldview can account for rational thought as such? The Christians or the non-Christians? Van Til proposed an internal critique of each worldview. Which worldview can account for the fact that we have rational minds that can make sense of the world? Which worldview can account for meaningful human thought and intelligible human experience? In short, which worldview can make sense of those things that we take for granted all the time? That the universe is an orderly, rational place, that our minds are equipped to determine truth, that there are objective standards of thought and behavior, that we are morally responsible for our actions, and so forth. Now this promises to be a powerful line of apologetic argument. It's a devastating critique of an unbelieving worldview if you can pull it off. But another prominent criticism of Van Til is that, has been that he never actually spelled out this transcendental argument in any of his writings. And there is some validity to that criticism, although it has been overstated. Uh, I wrote an article a number of years ago now in which I showed that Van Til does indicate in his various writings how he would make that argument. But even though Van Til himself may not have joined all the dots, a number of Christian thinkers have taken up that project and moved it forward in important ways. For example, two former students of Van Til, our own Dr. John Frame, the Orlando campus, uh, also the late Greg Barnson, have developed and defended Van Til's argument in different ways. I've tried to make some contributions of my own in some recent published articles. It's also noteworthy, however, that several other Christian philosophers who do not claim to be inspired by Van Til have developed arguments pointing in the same direction. Alvin Plantinga, who many regard as uh, the most influential Christian philosopher of recent times, has offered several different lines of argument for the idea that our ability to have thoughts and to gain knowledge about the world presupposes the existence of God and our having been created by God. And Plantinga is just one example of several Christian philosophers who are making this line of argument. All this is very encouraging. The more work that is done by Christian philosophers, the more we're finding Van Til's provocative claims to be vindicated. However, there is something perhaps even more encouraging and certainly more striking than this recent work in Christian apologetics. It's the fact that an increasing number of atheists are also vindicating Van Til's transcendental argument, albeit unintentionally. The trail goes back at least as far as Friedrich Nietzsche, the iconoclastic 19th century German philosopher. Nietzsche famously pronounced the death of God, by which he meant the death of serious belief in God. Nietzsche recognized, however, that dispensing with God is not a trivial matter. It has profound implications. You can't blot out the sun and then expect to live on in warmth and light. Nietzsche observed that once you give up God, you must also give up all the things that would depend on God, meaning and purpose in life, objective moral values, the rationality and intelligibility of the world, even the idea of objective truth. Nietzsche was, if you'll pardon the anachronism, a good Vantillian at least in his understanding of what follows when you deny the reality of God. Moving into the 20th century, the late pragmatist philosopher Richard Rorty contended that if you are going to take the atheistic, naturalistic, Darwinian worldview seriously, you need to abandon many of the traditional common sense views of truth and reason that we take for granted. Rorty maintained that if we are indeed the unintended products of mindless, unguided, evolutionary processes, then not only must we give up the idea 
that we possess a conscience, a kind of moral compass that points us in the direction of what is right, we must also give up the idea of human reason as a kind of intellectual compass that points us in the direction of what is true. There is no more an objective reality than there is an objective morality. What we call the truth is just a convenient but ultimately arbitrary human construction. Still more recently, another naturalist philosopher has forcefully argued that atheists need to completely abandon the idea of morality, not just absolute morality, morality. Joel Marx is a philosopher at the University of New Haven. For many years, he wrote a column entitled Moral Moments in a popular philosophy magazine. But in 2010, he came out of the closet as an amoralist. In an article entitled An Amoral Manifesto, which caused quite a stir, he made the following confession. The long and the short of it is that I became convinced that atheism implies amorality. And since I am an atheist, I must therefore embrace amorality. Marx distinguished between soft atheists who deny God but still believe in morality and hard atheists who deny both God and morality. For most of his career, he admits, he was a soft atheist until, he writes, I experienced my shocking epiphany that the religious fundamentalists are correct. Fancy that. <laughs> Without God, there is no morality. But they are incorrect, I still believe, about there being a God. Hence, I believe there is no morality. Well, if nothing else, one has to admire his intellectual integrity. I could continue with this list of atheistic Vantillians, but in the short time that remains, I want to discuss in more detail one very recent example of this trend, which may well be the most striking of all. Alex Rosenberg is professor of philosophy at Duke University, or Duke University as it's known in these parts. <laughs> Dr. Rosenberg specializes in the philosophy of science and the philosophy of biology, written many academic publications in those areas. He's very smart and he's very atheistic. Indeed, he's far more insightful about what atheism really involves than the so-called new atheists who unfortunately get a lot more media attention than he does. Last year, Rosenberg published a book with the title, The Atheist's Guide to Reality. It is a brilliantly written and argued book. I would recommend it to atheists and Christians alike. The subtitle of the book is Enjoying Life Without Illusions. And by illusions, Rosenberg doesn't just mean that we have to give up belief in God, he assumes that most of his readers have already done that. Rather, he means that if you are going to take your atheism seriously, you need to give up some of your most deeply held beliefs and assumptions. What most people would consider self-evident, common sense beliefs. Much of what we take for granted about ourselves and about our universe is illusory, he thinks. These common sense beliefs that we have are basically tricks that evolution has foisted on our brains. Now, some atheists have insisted that atheism isn't a philosophy. Atheism isn't a worldview. There's no such thing, they say, as the atheist worldview. Atheism is just the simple belief that there is no God, or it's a lack of belief in God. Rosenberg will have none of that. This is what he writes. There is much more to atheism than its knockdown arguments that there is no God. 
He doesn't bother to give us any of these knockdown arguments, by the way. He assumes that we're all familiar with them. There's much more to atheism. There is the whole rest of the worldview that comes along with atheism. It's a demanding, rigorous, breathtaking grip on reality, one that has been vindicated beyond reasonable doubt. It's called science. It soon becomes clear, however, that what Rosenberg means by science is really scientism. And he uses that second term more consistently throughout the book. Scientism is that worldview according to which science is the only real source of knowledge, scientific explanations are the only real explanations, and the only things that really exist are the things that science has uncovered. As he puts it, the basic things everything is made up of are fermions and bosons, elementary physical particles. That's it. And that's scientism. Now, scientism as a worldview, as a comprehensive view of reality, gives us answers. It gives us answers to the big questions of life. We may not like those answers, but it does give us clear and consistent answers. And what Rosenberg wants to do in his book is to explain in detail what those answers are and why we have to accept them, even if we don't like them, even if they seem quite absurd. In the book's introduction, he gives us a preview of where he will be going. This is how a well-informed atheist should answer the big questions. This is quoting from pages two and three of the book. Is there a God? No. What is the nature of reality? What physics says it is. What is the purpose of the universe? There is none. What is the meaning of life? Ditto. Why am I here? Just dumb luck. Does prayer work? Of course not. Is there a soul? Is it immortal? Are you kidding? Is there free will? Not a chance. What happens when we die? Everything pretty much goes on as before, except us. What is the difference between right and wrong, good and bad? There is no moral difference between them. Why should I be moral? Because it makes you feel better than being immoral. Is abortion, euthanasia, suicide, paying taxes, foreign aid, or anything else you don't like, forbidden, permissible, or sometimes obligatory? Anything goes. Where is love and how can I find it? Love is the solution to a strategic interaction problem. Don't look for it. It will find you when you need it. Does history have any meaning or purpose? It's full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Does the human past have any lessons for our future? Fewer and fewer, if it ever had any to begin with. The rest of his book is devoted to justifying and elaborating on these answers. This is how it goes. Rosenberg begins by arguing that if scientism is true, then there's no meaning, purpose, or direction in the universe whatsoever. Well, that's not so surprising. Uh, most atheists would agree with him on that. But he also argues that if scientism is true, then we should be nihilists about morality. Not even moral relativists. Nihilists. Rosenberg agrees with Joel Marx that atheists should be amoralists. Now he tries to soften the blow by arguing that even though nothing is really right or wrong, evolution has programmed most of us to be nice to each other. So he defends what he calls nice nihilism. But it's still nihilism. And that is a bitter pill that some atheists, including those moralizing new atheists, like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, aren't ready to swallow. They're soft atheists, remember? But Rosenberg isn't done yet. He goes on to argue that our common sense notion of a self 
The idea that, that I am a person, an individual subject of consciousness that endures through time with a distinctive first-person perspective on the world, that notion of a self is also a bewitching illusion. Scientism tells us that, strictly speaking, there is no I. There is no first person. So, strictly speaking, I am not a person. And neither are you, by the way. Now, if you think that's not only absurd, but self-defeating, I couldn't agree more. Yet perhaps the most radical claim that Rosenberg defends in the book is that if scientism is true, then none of us literally has thoughts about anything. The idea that we have minds distinct from our brains with thoughts about things external to us, that needs to be given up too, he insists. Rosenberg spends many pages defending this conclusion, coming at it from several different angles, but the core argument is actually pretty simple. So let me summarize it for you. Our common sense view is that our thoughts are about things. Our thoughts are directed towards objects beyond themselves, beyond those thoughts. So, for example, I have the thought that this academic gown would not be appropriate attire for the beach. Perhaps you have that thought too. If you, if you didn't before, you have it now. That thought is about something. The gown. That thought is directed towards something external to my mind. The gown. Now philosophers have a technical term for this remarkable feature of thought. They call it intentionality. Intentionality. Intentionality is the aboutness of our thoughts. And intentionality is one of the most distinctive features of thought, of minds. Now here's Rosenberg's argument. Science has no place for intentionality as a real feature of the world. For scientism tells us that everything that exists is physical. Everything that exists is material. It's all fermions and bosons. That's it. The universe is just lots of clumps of matter arranged in different ways. But a clump of matter, considered as such, can't be about anything. Take a handful of dirt, for example. What is that dirt about? What is it directed towards? Nothing. Or take a, a random crack in the pavement caused by the heat of the sun. What is that crack about? What does it refer to beyond itself? Nothing. A clump of matter considered as a clump of matter isn't really about anything. Let me quote directly from Rosenberg's book. One clump of matter can't be about another clump of matter. Clumps of matter do not exhibit intentionality. But here's the kicker. Your brain is just a clump of matter. According to scientism, there is no mind distinct from the brain. There are just brains. And brains are just clumps of matter. So whatever a brain might have, it does not have thoughts about things. Any more than your laptop or your iPhone has thoughts about things. Now Rosenberg thinks that this is just the sober truth. He thinks it's reality, hence the title of his book. I think it's nothing short of intellectual suicide, hence the title of this lecture. <laughs> it's the philosophical equivalent of chopping off your own head. If we really don't have thoughts about things, then Rosenberg doesn't have thoughts about reality, or thoughts about scientism, or thoughts about thoughts. Scientism ends up denying meaningful thought altogether. And so his scientism is radically self-defeating. If it were true, 
it would be literally impossible to believe it because there would be no beliefs about anything, including scientism. So why does Rosenberg believe it? And why does he believe it so fervently? Well, it's because he's firmly convinced that scientism is true. He thinks that modern science has confirmed scientism, that worldview. Now, we don't have time to examine his argument. I will simply state here for the record that, in my opinion, his argument for scientism is transparently feeble. And you'll just have to take my word for it. <laughs> but since there's no compelling reason to accept scientism, the rational thing to do in light of Rosenberg's argument is to reject scientism and, I would add, the naturalistic atheism that gave birth to it. So here we have an example of an extremely sharp atheist philosopher who argues that a thoughtful, well-informed atheist ought to renounce many of our deeply held common sense beliefs about morality, about purpose, about personhood, about the human mind, and about the very possibility of having meaningful thoughts about anything. Now, what should we make of all this? Let me conclude with four very brief, and they will be brief, points of application. First, we should be encouraged that Van Til's transcendental argument for the existence of God is being increasingly vindicated, not only by Christian philosophers, but by non-Christian philosophers. If there were no God, there would be no rational, meaningful human thought. Atheism is epistemologically self-defeating. And that is good news for Christian apologetics. Second, we should note that this confirms what the Bible says about the folly of unbelief and the futility of unbelieving thought. The biblical idea of foolishness has nothing to do with intelligence. It's not about people's IQs. Very smart people can be very foolish in the biblical sense. And the fact that very smart people would sooner abandon common sense and embrace self-defeating absurdities than accept the reality of God only underscores the Bible's assessment of the unbelieving mindset. Third, on a related point, we should also recognize the stubbornness of unbelief. Again, it is, it is astonishing that some people are more willing to deny right and wrong or more willing to deny that they really have thoughts about things than to concede that there is a creator God. The noetic effects of sin run deep and they bind tightly. Frankly, if I weren't a Calvinist, I would despair. If I can put this reverently, thank God for efficacious grace. Finally, I think these observations should cultivate a deep humility in all of us. Because we should look at these atheist philosophers and say, they're but for the grace of God. Are we smarter than they are? No, not at all. It's not a matter of intelligence, not a matter of IQ. And so when we hear the absurd conclusions reached by these thinkers, we must resist the temptation to say in our hearts, like that Pharisee in Jesus' parable, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like those atheists. There is no place in Christian apologetics for intellectual self-righteousness. And so the first step, the first step in every discussion with an unbeliever, in every debate with an unbeliever, should be a simple two-part prayer. Lord, thank you for your grace toward me. Lord, please pour out that same grace on them. Amen.